Our second scripture reading is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. This is after Abraham has heard God speak a voice to him. Abraham has left his home, his home religion, his own family, and traveled far away with his nephew Lot. And he's gone out to help Lot. And he's won a great battle. May God's blessing fall upon the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of these words. After Abram's return from the defeat of Chaldemir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Praise be to God. Let us pray. God Almighty, we pray this hour that you would pour into me the gift of preaching, and that you would pour into your congregation a hunger, and a thirst to be fed by you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, this is the second of four weeks where we'll be focusing on the, the topic of stewardship in our sermon time. And if you were with us last week, and if you weren't, you're about to get a recap. Uh, The word steward, the biblical word that has been placed in steward and has been used in church for about 500 years, 400 years, uh, wasn't always there. There was a word there, but it wasn't steward. See, the word steward was was picked uh, at a particular time to be used during in in a really famous translation of the Bible. And the time period was when in old Europe it was the feudal system where you had really three tiers of people. You had the Lord, one person, and then a ton of peasants, and then the people just under the Lord. And the arrangement back then was the Lord owned everything in in the land and was responsible for everything, including the care of the peasants. The peasants eked out an existence, but they were fended from warring armies coming from afar because the Lord would send out help. But under every good Lord was a successful manager who lived in the second biggest castle in the land, whose job it was to, was to take the Lord's goods and to manage them on behalf of the Lord. The name of that person was the steward. To be a steward was an honor. To be a steward was the position in life you prayed that your, one of, at least one of your friends or one of your children would get to. Very rare that it would happen. And it would only take place to somebody who was absolutely wise and blessed, trustworthy, to be named steward, because ultimately the Lord's responsible for the land. But the steward carried out the Lord's work. Now, you could become a Lord, but you'd have to be born into royalty, which was... Not going to happen for most of us. That's the name, this name steward was, was uh, handpicked when they were writing and translating what is known as the King James Version of the Bible. In 1611, it was complete. And the translators had tons of words they could use to plug in for the Greek word that Jesus used in the parable of the stewards. And they selected, out of all the words, they selected an honorable word. Steward. And so last week we looked at all the uh, uh, biblical images and out of, out of them all we grabbed hold of the image of Pharaoh and Joseph as the arrangement between a lord and a steward. Pharaoh was the king of all of Egypt. He owned everything, the most powerful secular leader on wor- in the world. And Joseph was placed under Pharaoh's command to be as authoritative as Pharaoh. The only difference between Joseph and Pharaoh was Joseph wasn't royalty. But he had the authority to act as if he himself were Pharaoh. He was given the second, the second coolest chariot in the kingdom. It says so. He lived in the second biggest uh, castle. I don't know what they called him back then. Second biggest mansion in Egypt. And his job was to receive from Pharaoh and take care of everybody. 
And if you read the entire story, Joseph was, in fact, an excellent steward. He was a great manager of the economics of that country. Now, out of the lesson last week, obviously the parallels are that God is like our Pharaoh, or God is like our Lord, the owner of everything. And our job as a steward isn't a drag. It's not, oh, man, preacher's talking about stewardship again. (laughs) Or watch your wallet, guys. God is the owner of everything. And to be named a steward by God is an absolute honor. And out of all the images of what it means to be a Christian, to be a steward is in the top three. To be an ambassador of the kingdom of God, to live like you know him, to go fishing for people, and we're going to get there. And the third is to be a steward of all the things God entrusts to you. The church is a steward of God's mysteries. That's what Paul says in the scriptures. Of the table, of the sacraments, of the gospel. We've been entrusted with the light of Christ to bring it. If not us, who else, right? And you as a family, you as an individual, your household, have been charged and entrusted with several things to take care of. And so if you got anything from last week, it's, one is it's an honor to be called a steward of God's goods. And number two is don't forget who actually owns them. While we manage them, and just pretend you've got a manager for your, your, your finances, uh, maybe a, a, a financial manager, financial planner. What if you showed up one time and realized he or she's been using your money that he was to be managing for his, himself? I'd fire mine. So it's important for us to recognize as stewards, our job isn't to confuse our guardianship over our children, over our bodies, over the homes we've been entrusted to, the finances, our time. Don't confuse our guardianship with ownership. Does that make sense? That's the main gist of last week's sermon. So this week's sermon, we are dealing with the basic, uh, one basic scriptural and churchy uh, element of stewardship, which is the tithe. Now, I'm going to say this up front. The tithe is a, an, it's an important, very important part of stewardship, but it's a very small part of stewardship compared to, the, to the, what we're going to get to next week, which is what you do to manage all the rest of God's stuff you take home. Those are good stewards. So don't, don't say, I, I tithe, and so I'm done. Please don't do that. My hope is that we're good stewards back at home, and we'll get to that next week. Well, the story of the tithe actually is, it found its, its beginning in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Moses, uh, Abra- I always say Moses. Abraham has heard a voice from God, and he lived his own life. He lived in an entirely different culture. He heard a voice from an unknown, an unseen God, and followed him, left behind his family of origin, left behind his hometown, everybody. Now, if somebody did that today, we would call them insane. But back then, he heard from God, and it was, in a, it was a powerful move from Abraham. At the time, his name was Abram before he was given the name Abraham. And he's still called Abram in our story today. And all the things that Abram takes with him, uh, he leaves behind several things. He takes several things with him as well, including he's entrusted with a nephew whose name is Lot. And Lot follows Abram. And and after they get to what is called the promised land that God has promised to Abraham, uh, Lot and, and, and Abram part ways, mostly because their cattle need to graze on separate lands. You've been there. And so there wasn't enough land and so, uh, to live right next to each other, so they separated a little bit. Lot ends up living in a town that becomes infamous, Sodom, which was neighbored by another town, Gomorrah. And we'll get to that story at another time. And so while he's living there, while Lot's living there, some kings come of a foreign land. They come and they sack the towns and they steal Lot, his family, and all the other possessions in the town. So now Abram's stuck in a, in a dilemma because he has been charged as a steward to be entrusted with Lot to take care of him. And so now he's responsible for Lot. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. And so he's got to go after Lot and help him. And so in the story right before our scripture reading, Abraham hits his knees and prays, and God gives him 315 or 318, depending on the version you read, trained men to go after these great armies. Well, I don't need to get into the details of warfare, but what took place was an absolute miracle. Using this small group of people, Abram went and was successful at reclaiming his nephew, reclaiming all the possessions. He completely defeated those foreign kings. And while he's carrying back all the goods, he's met by somebody. He's met by a man named, that we know as Melchizedek. And jot this down if you've got a pen. Hebrews chapter 7, 1 through 7. That goes into the details of who this Melchizedek is. 
I'm going to give you a little information. Melchizedek, we find out he's a priest of God, but his name means king of righteousness and prince of peace. Hebrews chapter 7 teaches that he has no mother or father. He wasn't hit no genealogy. He wasn't born. He was begotten. Remind you of anyone? So Abraham's walking, and he meets this guy named the Prince of Peace. You can fill in the blank. He meets the Prince of Peace, <laughs> the King of Righteousness, who wasn't made but begotten. And this Prince of Peace of the order of Melchizedek comes up to Abraham and says, You've done well. May I bless you? And on behalf of God, Melchizedek the priest blesses Abraham and says, Blessed be you, Abraham, by God the Most High. And blessed be the God who delivered these things into your hands. And do you know what Abraham's knee-jerk reaction to that blessing was? He gave a tenth back. That's where the tithe comes from. And over the years, over the years, as the Jewish identity grew in the desert, 500 years later as they're wandering, out of all the things that could retain out of these stories, the tithe stuck that it's an important part of the tradition and of the people of God who are provided by God to continue to return a noticeably large, painful amount back to God. That's where it came from. So if anybody ever asks you, where does the tithe come from? Just tell them that story. It's in the Bible. Now, this morning, I I wanted to touch on where tithing fits in into our stewardship as God's people. Uh, But before we get there, I wanted to pause And I want to go right at two reasons that I've heard preached regularly to tithe that I think are flat-out unbiblical. And uh, and in some ways, uh, they rob us of the true meaning of tithing. The first one that I've heard is that we should tithe because God needs our money. It's a joke, right? God needs our money, right? God's just... You do realize that before the creation of the heavens and the earth, this... Scriptures teach that God was with him, like God's cool, like he had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's living, he's having fun. And out of love for himself, out of love between those three guys right here, out of love between the God, the triune God, we were birthed. We're a product of the love of God between God's self. That's kind of beautiful if you think about it. But God's just fine. God, using only his words, made the stars. God owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. He even owns the hills. God doesn't need your money. Okay? God doesn't need your money. And in fact, to believe that God needs your money completely reverses the basic gist of stewardship, which is God owns everything. It's not yours, it's not your money. God has given it to you. If God, if God gave it to you, He wouldn't need it. That makes sense? And so tithing isn't loaning God a dollar. Dear God, poor God, here's here's your dollar. Tithing is not loaning God a dollar. So don't tithe because we believe that God needs our money. Because we worship a powerful God who can make a path in the desert. He can make the entire world out of nothing. The second reason I've heard that we should tithe, um, it's a nice reason. I love it. It's a kind reason. But it's not the biblical root of tithing. I've heard that we should tithe so that our church doors can stay open. We've all heard that. Tithe so that your church doors can stay open. Now, by all means, as a person employed by the church, please continue to tithe. But if you boil tithing down to paying to keep something you care for open, not only do you steal it, and we're going to get to the true reason to tithe, of the true reason to tithe, but you're paying for service. That makes sense? It's good to give to things you care for, to support things you care for. I give to things that I, that I care for. It's important to me. But to die so that the church can keep their doors open will rob it of its true meaning, its true biblical meaning. And so for this stewardship season, for this October, I want you to, to set aside those two reasons. You might have heard from TV preachers, or, or I've heard it from all over the place. Set aside those two reasons because scripturally they're not in there. They're just not in there. But here are two good reasons to tithe, biblical reasons to tithe. Number one, God calls people to tithe. God calls stewards to return a 10% of what he has given us because he wants your heart. 
He doesn't want your money. He really doesn't. God doesn't, I mean, doesn't need your money, doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Ladies, what's the best way to a man's heart? Through his stomach. (laughs) God has learned, and Jesus Christ revealed it. He said the best way to get to places in the heart of a human being that God didn't have access to otherwise was through their wallets. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your your heart is also. God, that's not everything. That's not the only way to give your heart to God. But if you do not give God access through the finances that God has entrusted to you, you are and I am necessarily withholding access to our hearts in certain areas from God. And the only way, the only way to actually experience that is to try it. I'm not up here to convince you. I'm just teaching the scriptures. God wants access to your heart. In a few weeks, we're doing a What Pleases God series. Don't you wonder what pleases God? And that's, I'm going to give away my first sermon. When people give their heart to God. Remember the act of worship is taking your heart and giving it to God? When you tithe, what you're doing is giving God access to your heart in a way that he wouldn't otherwise have. There are other ways to give God access to your heart. A great way is prayer. A great way is coming to this table. One way Valerie and I discovered that we think has been kind of a lost art in the church has been fasting. Giving something up for a period of time. I joke that fasting from something is like turning off your television so you can listen to your spouse talk to you. It removes a distraction. You're giving God access to your heart. What y'all are doing right now, showing up to church, listening to a, pre- to a preacher speak on the scriptures, you are tr- choosing right now through the act of preaching to give God access to your heart. Do you see that? It's dangerous, y'all, to give God access to your heart. So you tithe, I tithe biblically because Jesus said, where your treasure is there, your heart is also, and he wants access to your heart. That's the number one reason to tithe. That lady, Grace, in our former church, she, she's discovered that. And she said, just because I'm not able to go to a church I trust right now, I'm still going to give God access to my heart in this way. Is this making sense? The second reason to tithe. Number one is give God your heart. Number two, remember when Pharaoh charged Joseph to go out and and, and govern and to manage Pharaoh's stuff? Pharaoh put something on Joseph's finger, a ring. I joked that the ring was a little heavy. If you were typing, you'd keep typing L's on accident. And the ring, while it meant many things, it it meant an authority so that when Joseph spoke, it was like Pharaoh was speaking. But I think it was also a constant reminder to Joseph. It was a reminder. He looked down on that ring more than anybody else looked at that ring and thought, holy cow, I almost forgot this is God's stuff. I almost forgot this is Pharaoh's stuff. This is not my stuff. I'm just the manager. Valerie and I, and I shared with you this week, uh, this past week, we're a tithing family. We just... Pull the, pull the decimal spot one, one part over, and there's your tithe for the year. We are a tithing family. We're also a budgeting family. And when we sit down and do our monthly budget, and we start to list out all the things that will be cash flowing, it's fun. It's fun to do it, by the way, to have a cash plan. We'll do Dave Ramsey here. It'll be great. But we go through and we list everything that, that we're responsible for, and then we assign it a number, and every dollar has a purpose. But the first thing we write on the top of our list is tithe, or God. And we tithe first. And you know what happens after that in our meetings? It changes the way we start dealing with all the other categories, with God's money. Oh, this, when we buy groceries, we're still using God's money. And we have to make deliberate decisions as a reminder that the way we're making choices that reflect our values financially need to be in line with the fact that we're using God's cash. So that when we go out on a date or have a little category that says entertainment, we have to stand before God and say, we trust that you gave us part of these finances to enjoy. But our goal is to make sure that our finances match our priorities. They match our values. Next week, we're going to get to that type of stewardship. But the tithe serves as a constant reminder. 10%, I'll never forget, first time Valerie and I had a conversation when we were dating about tithing. That's a lot. It's a noticeable amount. Tied to give God your heart. Tied to give God, to give you a reminder that you are a steward.
True stewardship, the deep tale of steward, we'll get to next week. Now, it's not my job, guys. I've got, uh, I've got Robin Grimes here from VBS. Not my job description. As, as a pastor, it's my job to feed you the scriptures, and it's my job to encourage you all to be great stewards with what you have. And many times these sermon series turn into a fundraising campaign, and that's just not what I do. That's not what I do. My job is to lead you all into good financial and relational and possess, possession-oriented stewardship for the talents, for the finance, finances, finances, for everything that you have. My job is not to here to drum up support financially for the church. However, it's a no-brainer. Churches that are full of faithful stewards have more money. Churches that are full of financial households, that are, are good financial steward households, have more resources for doing, for doing ministry. It's a no-brainer. But please, make sure the, the root, the cause, the desperation for you to be a good tither comes because you want to give God your heart. And it comes because you want to be faithful unto him. And I promise you, if you give God access, if you give Jesus influence over your life, even financially, you will see miracles. That's what I want for us. Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bring our lives before you, and we open our hands, knowing very well we've received greatly from you. We ask that you would not withhold from us and that we would not withhold from you. In the name of Jesus, we pray this hour that, uh, that you would show us, Lord, that you would put it on our hearts, how it is that we're to return our hearts to you through our finances. May we be uh, desperate to give ourselves back over to you, and may we live according to your scriptures. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. My friends, as, 